It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Karshev Chotori. Please. Uh, Karshev is an artist, photographer, and architect. And um, we thought if we talk about the topic of countryside and all these projections and issues that we uh, are interested in but not so clear uh, what they mean, we need to have you with us for this discussion. Uh, Karshev uh, is famous, among others, for uh, winning the uh, Aga Khan Award two years ago, one of the highest uh, prizes that you can have uh, as a younger architect uh, uh, internationally. And he's uh, based in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, so, of course, exposed to one of the most exciting uh, countrysides that, that we know, but also to a situation of extremely rapid urbanization. Uh, so, I think that, uh, Dark, uh, that uh, Kashev can, can combine the tension that, that we're interested in to look at. He has a, a, a first life as a photographer, and then this life continues, of course, and the uh, second life now as a successful uh, architect, writer, and lecturer. Thanks for coming here. It's great to have you. Thank you. Um, I would first like to thank the organizers and the um, curators for inviting me to this wonderful forum. Um, when we sort of begin to discuss our association with um, the countryside, and by extension to nature, perhaps we begin by conceding that man is forever in love with nature. Leave aside natural disasters, and nature is unfailingly beautiful. Um, uh, Rare is one who has not been touched by this beauty. Um, but other than this romantic kind of disposition, perhaps there is a more potent philosophical basis for our approach to the idea of man in nature, and more importantly, to um, the ideas of place making. We use the term mother nature, or refer to nature as her. But perhaps we can also think of nature sort of looking back at us and the places we make. We then immediately uh, sort of uh, look at the questions of memory and the consciousness of place. These are some of the realizations uh, sort of that I've been working with. And uh, before I take you to Bengal, where most of my work is, um, I would like to share with you some thoughts and ideas which have uh, sort of uh, informed uh, my work. <coughs> Impressions. That feeling of being in the delta. Hot, humid, breezy, mosquitoes. Patches of green in a sea of greens. Look up and see an ocean in clouds. Gray, white, or the colors of the sun. Sun, that beautiful light I remember from my childhood. Slashes of afternoon on the golden of the straw. I remember the smell. I remember the sounds of the straw. When I said I love the rain, the sun, and everything in between, I meant I wanted to build to enjoy the rain, the sun, and everything in between. And where else but here, the home of the Brahmaputra and the Jamuna rivers wedded together in the softest soil, moist as the womb of the mother. Before the shadow of the rock, the Himalayas, the largest delta in the world, touches the waters of the bay. This is Bengal, a geocultural region woven out of an intricate network of rivers and canals, and to which all art forms respond, from the emotionally rendered Bhawaiya songs, to the colors of Nokshi Katha textiles, to the living and lost architecture of the Delta. Much of my childhood was spent by the side of the river Padma, which draws its waters from the mighty Ganges. It is difficult to bring to words my memories with those waters of the clouds, both above and soaked in reflection and the finest and softest of all soils, the alluvial layers where the ground was still moist from receding waters. But it is not merely the impact of those elements. For me, a river is not the same again, or rain, or the darkness 
before a storm in monsoon. I have been forever changed by the spirituality of that land. The tropical light introduces us to the landscape of Bengal. The strong sun's light reveals the beauty of its nature. It falls on mountains, fields of paddy, and trees, but the rest is spilt light, lost light. It is the architect who, by the design of his apertures, brings in the spilt light into the deep insides of his architecture. He gives it shape, lets it play, or prevents it from removing his shadows. For with the darkness of shadows comes the appreciation of light, of the color of light, of the depth of light. Have you seen the depth of Khan's light? At the National Assembly building in Dhaka, Khan brings in a silvery light, playful as the water from which the building rises. Nowhere has a space been more gracefully lit than by the mag magical light of his tropical sun. I am in search of shadows, shadows under a banyan tree, behind a column, or from a dark cloud. Have you ever been in a forest, a temple, or in a village courtyard? Shadows have a wonderful way of celebrating the presence of light. They seem to say, we do not hide. Our purpose is to reveal. Too many times we have seen buildings naked, sunburned, clad only in a curtain of glass. What is the purpose, I say? Let us not chase the shadows away. Then we are left with a pale, dead light, uninspiring, unnecessary. I return to the comfort of the shadow which the light has brought in. Materials, ask me not of materials. I'm still listening to the story of the clay earth millions of years before you have uncovered it, molded it, burnt it for bricks or terracotta temples. I wish to know more and I want to learn to care like gold in the hands of a goldsmith and all oh, the textures, the imperfections, the feeling, the beckoning. The building doesn't need ornament. The material is the ornament. There was a time when I thought I couldn't live in the city. It was too powerful, too much happening in too little time. Then I realized it was possible to create your own secret space in a city. It would be free from the rush elsewhere. It would have its own pace, its own time. Time. Is it true that if the sun hadn't moved, there wouldn't have been time? Or is it locked in a Swiss watch or in a Japanese pendulum? I like to leave time out of my buildings, for I sense that leaves out a lot of other things, styles, trends, isms, and so on. I'm tired of efficient buildings, buildings that offer you not a moment to pause, to ponder, to wish, to recollect. Buildings that work well, better than you'd wish for, and give you nothing else. In an office or railway station, yes. But in a home or in front of art, in an art gallery, I look for a loss of time, absence of time. And then there arises the opportunity for serenity to invade and silence. The silence of a breeze, the silence of a deep sleep, the silence of a space. My work used to confuse me, but it was important to be confused. I sense in confusion lies the seeds of discovery, of truth. I drink a drink from the broth of seven or 10,000, yes, thousand years of my history, and I feel alive again. The myth, the mystery, the mysticism, the emotion, the philosophy, the chaos, the romance. Yes, I'm in love with the Bengali way of life. Come away with me for an hour of the Sarod, and you will know what I mean. 
but ask me not of my work, for I create for the love of art. And ask me not of the present or of the future, I know neither. The first project that I wish to show you is in the north of the country for an um, NGO named Friendship. Um, they work with some of the poorest of poor, and it is a learning center in the middle of a very pristine um, kind of agricultural uh, rural um, countryside. Um, the land that we found was this, and it is um, prone to flooding. You might know that Bangladesh experiences um, climate change in real terms, and every year the floods are getting worse, and this place um, sort of uh, faces floods to about eight feet or 10 feet, which is three meters uh, every year. So um, our option was, um, like on the left, to build above the level of the floods um, uh, uh, the entire complex. But in trying to raise the entire complex above the level of the floods, we were losing almost the entire budget. Uh, at that time, it was about 400,000 euros. It was a very limited budget, but that budget was going underground because we were trying to raise the entire learning center above the level. And of course, they did not work. And uh, the final uh, design is what you see on the diagram on the right, um, is we built on the low ground, on the existing low ground, and protected the complex with a mini embankment or berm. With that came the attendant problem of rainwater getting uh, sort of collected in the, in the spaces within. And we introduced a series of tanks and pools to, to harvest uh, this water. And, um, and this plan is very simple. So it's in two parts. On the left, you see this block, which has the learning center. It has the, uh, the meeting rooms, the training rooms, uh, library, all centered around a central pavilion, which is the uh, reception pavilion. On the right is uh, the residential block, again centered around a, a pavilion form, which is the dining pavilion. Now, uh, th this project is very much inspired by ruins of Buddhist monasteries in the region, um, at least a thousand years old, and um, some dating back to the third century BC. And, and these ruins uh, are, are beautiful in the sense with their textures, and, uh, but you have to sort of use your imagination to sort of try to think how they were. And for example, this is a monk's cell where a monk would medi meditate for days without uh, food and sometimes even water. And sort of we sought to sort of transform this into this, where uh, sort of we continue uh, uh, from the building into the landscape by using um, a thermal mass in the form of uh, earth covering on the roof. And therefore, the building sort of continues or becomes one uh, with the landscape. Uh, the broken forms and pavilions in, in the complex is intentional to sort of um, facilitate uh, natural cross ventilation and also with the introduction of the pools that I talked about, uh, we helped with microclimatic cooling. And therefore, although this area does experience very hot summers, we were able to avoid air conditioning. So one goes down into the, the lower uh, ground level, which is the existing uh, ground level, and to find these various pavilions and, and open sort of plan forms. Um, and, and the material really is, the material palette is very simple. It's mostly handmade bricks locally produced. Um, and and uh, sort of uh, the whole space is uh, woven out of uh, courtyards, uh, pavilions, uh, gardens, uh, and pools. This is the, um, the dining pavilion. And, and I say the only luxury, because we have such limited budget uh, for this project, uh, I say the only luxury we could sort of offer was the luxury of light and shadows. The other thing which was important was to sort of um, bring in a balance, because here some of the very uh, 
poor people would come um, uh, for, for their training. And for example, this is a training session going on where people sit on the floor, the villagers who uh, live near the river and whose uh, houses get eroded, and uh, sort of they come here. But at the same time, we have visitors from uh, Europe, for example, or the Western world, uh, donor agencies, UN agencies. And so there was a need to balance uh, the, the kind of spatial quality and the kind of um, uh, the, the, the ambience, which is not too luxurious, but not too, uh, so we needed to sort of look into the detailing, uh, but the simple use of uh, materials as well. So, um, this project is in, 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 in the north eastern part of Bangladesh. It is for the Samdani Art uh, Foundation who uh, sponsor and uh, are the founders of the Dhaka Art Summit. It's a, it happens every two years and it is about to start in a week's time. Um, and uh, it, it is their art center and sculpture park in a place called Silet. Um, and it is, the area uh, is bounded on three sides by India, the hills uh, uh, of India, the Himalayan range uh, as it continues. But the area also has a lot of um, uh, water bodies and estuaries and it's very green. And uh, this is the site as we found it and uh, with a lot of um, uh, paddy fields and um, uh, lush overgrowth. And our idea was instead of having a large building to sort of separate out these buildings and sort of uh, merge them or, or place them in the landscape. And so, uh, so there are three sort of uh, points. The first is an entry point, an entry sort of structure, which is really a space trap. So that space does not leak out or leak in. So one arrives at this point and sort of gets off and walks in. And, um, Or, or takes uh, one of the buggies in case of rain. And it is built um, of uh, local handmade uh, bricks. This is under construction. Uh, it is to be completed uh, in the second half of this year. The next set of buildings is the artist's retreat or residences for artists who would come and stay and work. Um, so we chose a small hillock uh, with um, uh, an area where there's a lot of overgrowth and an area which is barren. And um, one of the ideas was to sort of use these units of artists' houses and sort of uh, move them around to find a kind of a, a good balance uh, in terms of, of, of space and sort of views in and out of the, um, of the sort of uh, campus. And this is uh, sort of what we arrived at. And um, so the views were important, the views out from the various spaces and the view towards um, uh, these spaces as well. And this is the final plan which uh, sort of shows the, uh, on the right is the houses which are in the barren area and uh, a dining pavilion and other spaces inserted uh, among the trees and bamboo overgrowth. So very simple, again, almost monastic, very simple uh, rooms uh, or houses for artists. And these are placed variously sort of to create the spaces. Um, and uh, this is, for example, the entry to the, to the houses. And um, the wall takes on the color of the earth. The earth here is reddish brown. Uh, it is concrete cast in wood and uh, the floor is the cheapest stone we can get. It's a grayish green kind of a stone and it forms a kind of a unifying uh, kind of a platform on which these buildings are placed with variously kind of curated views um, outside. Uh, these views are important because uh, as, as you can imagine, this is a sculpture park, there would be many installations. So the views outwards uh, were of course very important. The last, last structure is the, is the one on the left. Uh, it is, it is a, uh, it's a gallery. Uh, so the curator said, oh, we need a black box or a white box, and it's a 60 feet by 80 feet, and we don't need anything else. But of course, after the meeting, I realized that we need to sort of converse with the, uh, the landscape. And uh, so I quickly uh, sort of drew this up, which within a few hours became this. And, um, and now it's a, uh, it's, it's a brick building uh, which has uh, sort of two uh, kind of uh, spaces and it sits 
in the paddy fields where agriculture continues and uh, again it's made of uh, these handmade, uh, local handmade uh, bricks. And then inside is the box, but in between the box and the sort of undulating uh, uh, the walls uh, are the spaces for, again, installations and sculpture. I thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Kashev, for this beautiful presentation. Uh, Kashev's work is uh, on view at the Schweizer Architekturmuseum in Basel, curated by Andreas Ruby, also published in this book, which is going to be at the entrance, on view until uh, June. So please all go there. And before that, please ask questions to Kashev. We have a couple of minutes for asking questions. Thomas. Well, I am interested to learn just a few sentences about the sustainability issue with the water rising. And, and uh, your, your construction, is it sustainable or is it, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess of course it is, but I want to raise the question. Uh, is the water raising more and more or is there an end? What, what's your assessment in, in Bangladesh of the water situation over the longer term and the implications for your architecture? Okay. So I think there are two questions. One is sustainability, the other is the, the rise of the water. So the, the rise of the water, if there is, in Bangladesh you see from one end of the country to the other, it's a, it's a, it's a difference in terms of height, it's a difference of 15 meters. So it's very different from here in the Engadine, for example. Um, but that's what it is. And therefore, with a rise of about 1.5 meters, uh, nearly a third or more than a third of the country would be underwater. So it's, it's, it's not a joke. Uh, uh, climate change is very, very real in Bangladesh. And because with rising temperatures, you know that the snow melts. And in the, we are sitting just next to the mighty Himalayas, you know, uh, the mountain range, which is a bigger brother than the Alps here. And, um, and the waters that I showed you, the rivers that I showed you, come directly from the glaciers in Tibet. And it's melting faster. Uh, every year, as I said, the, the floods are worse, and every year uh, it, it's, it's unpredictable. Uh, at the time of the floods are also changing, so it's not like we know when the floods are going to come. So uh, it's shifting, everything is shifting. Uh, so it's very real in that way. And uh, to be very frank, it's, uh, at the moment, I don't think there is a very strong or concrete kind of a solution in place uh, to sort of counter this. But climate change does not affect Bangladesh only in terms of water. It also affects by way of the cyclones. Um, because uh, you might know Bangladesh sort of is in a very complex weather system. Uh, uh, the, bay, uh, the Bay of Bengal uh, sort of uh, is home to cyclones, which are like hurricanes in the, in the US, but um, uh, somewhat bigger. And uh, with wind speeds up to uh, 280 kilometers per hour, you know, it's, uh, it's quite crazy. And um, these happen almost every other year. But definitely once every decade, there's a major cyclone. And for example, I'm working on a project for a cyclone shelter, which is also on exhibit at the, uh, at the SAM in Basel. And um, uh, for that, it was a, it, that cyclone, for example, uh, killed more than 10,000 people. So how do you sort of address those issues? I mean, how do you encounter a cyclone? How do you encounter floods which, you know, come in at such speed and with such, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, strength? I think it's quite difficult. The other question about sustainability is that in, in Bangladesh, as, as I, I understand it personally, is uh, also economy. Because sometimes we miss this idea that sustainability has also to do with economy. The more money we save, it's more sustainable. 
apart from the other things, apart from the sort of bringing down the cost of running it, the cost of operating it, the cost of power, etc., the cost of making it, the cost of you know uh, embedded energy, etc., but also the cost of making it within optimized budget. I'm not saying cheap but optimization of resources, not only just money, but also other resources like labor and et cetera. So this is something we try to do in all our projects. So, so that's what we try. Thanks. Yeah, please. It was wonderful to see the two um, lectures right after each other. And when I first saw the Learning Center, I thought, well, you're going to tell us that you actually are letting it flood and everybody moves to the roofs, which I thought was a nice analogy to the collapsing shed. Um, do you actually have to design the buildings so that if it does flood, that they will like maintain? No, unfortunately not, <laughs> or fortunately not, because if it does flood, it's not going to go away. When the flood comes in, it stays for at least a couple of weeks. So um, it's not like in Venice. It's it's more difficult, so uh, we don't we don't let it flood in the sense we so don't let it walls. come in so much. But uh, as it happens, last year there was flood all around that embankment uh, to a height of about two meters. Uh, but uh, we were safe; we were protected by this just ramped earth embankment. There is no other reinforcement or anything, so it's just ramped earth. It's very economical to make, but uh, we got saved. Yeah, and we, we remain dry. Yeah, if that's your question, yes. Another question? If not, we would uh, start the coffee break. And I would like to thank you again very much, Kashif.